All right, I think it's time to start. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Topology Optimization Webinar. Today, this session is uh, focusing on Topology Optimization for Manufacturing. It is organized by my colleague, Matthias Nangana at Delphi University of Technology. Thank you, Matthias. The floor is yours. Thanks, Yun, for uh, the quick intro. And uh, yeah, welcome, everybody. Let me start by giving a a uh, short introduction to the topic before we go to the to the presenters. So for that, I will uh, share my screen. Yes, so the, the this is actually a thematic uh, edition of the top webinars. We focus on a specific topic, in this case, topology optimization for manufacturing. And yeah, to, to explain what we mean by that, let me first talk about a generic uh, product development process, like you can see uh, depicted here schematically. So typically you start with some requirements and then through some design process, in our case, we focus on topology optimization, you end up with a design and then with a certain chosen manufacturing process, this can be turned into a physical product. Now, typically in, in our field, if you look at most of the literature, our focus is on this first step, how to make the link between the requirements and, and a certain optimal design. Um, and that is, I think, important because uh, in many cases and for many products, for, for many problems, there are already fundamental questions to be answered here. But if we only focus on this part, we may end up with a design that is not manufacturable in the end. So you may have to make modifications that are either very expensive or perhaps impossible. And uh, yeah, also all these modifications probably destroy the optimality of, of your design. So therefore, yeah, the concept of design for manufacturing, in fact, uh, is broader than the topology optimization. It's a general approach towards a, a design process. And that means that we have to look at this entire chain. We have to look at also uh, what is possible in the specific manufacturing process that we consider and include those restrictions or those properties already in the, uh, yeah, in the conceptual phase of the design process. Now for this, yeah, this also this has been recognized since a long time, I think, especially even in the early days of topology optimization, getting rid of, uh, for instance, the checkerboards, which, which were not uh, manufacturable or other manufacturing aspects was already uh, considered. And still there are many questions uh, to be answered here. So that's why we have this uh, session because there's a wide variety of manufacturing processes and I've here categorized them broadly in, in four groups. So on the left, you see uh, forming processes like, like forging. And here the amount of material does not change, but the shape of the, of the component is changed and perhaps also the properties. The second one is a subtractive process, milling. And there, uh, yeah, materials being removed from the workpiece. The opposite happens in additive processes, like you can see here, it is a 3D printing process. Uh, and especially in this category, yeah, there's a lot of development. I'm sure that you've, uh, you've all heard about that. And also the content of this session will, uh, will reflect that. And finally, there is also the process of assembly, which I hear also included in the manufacturing uh, categories, uh, where actually uh, yeah, a product is composed of uh, joining uh, several parts together. So for each of these, uh, these groups and each of the specific techniques in there, there's a need for uh, yeah, automated design methods, how to include these specific constraints in the, in the optimization process. And that brings me to the, to the program for today. So we will have five talks on manufacturing uh, related to topology optimization. Um, like I mentioned, many of them will have to do with, uh, with, with have a link with additive manufacturing since that is what we see uh, uh, most uh, prominent in the recent literature. We'll start uh, with a talk by, uh, by Benedict Kriegersman on uh, assembly. So how to design for assembly. Uh, the second talk by Hollis Smith will be on also something related to assembly or composing composite structures uh, of, of bar or beam-like uh, components. And the other three talks uh, will be related to additive manufacturing. The third talk by uh, Jay Book Lee is on design of infill structures. Uh, the fourth talk is on actually uh, not only designing the part, but also aspects of the process of, uh, of printing a component by uh, Mathilde Boisier, also looking at uh, optimization of the scanning path in the printing process. And uh, the session is concluded by uh, Suchan uh, Liu, who will talk about uh, additive manufacturing and how to deal with uh, uh, enclosed voids. 
But uh, before we go there, uh, I think we have a long way uh, to go and a lot of interesting uh, presentations to see. So I will. I would like to ask the presenters to uh, try to stay within the time frame. After 12 minutes, I will ask you to conclude so that we have time for some questions. And also at the end of the session, we have time for some uh, questions and general discussion. So with that, uh, Benedict, I'd like to ask you to, uh, to share your screen and give your presentation. Thank you very much, Matthias. Yes, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Benedict Kriegesmann and I'm presenting the work that's mainly conducted by my PhD, Olaf Ambroskiewicz, who's also here in the Zoom meeting and can uh, even answer the detailed question, most detailed question you might have. And as Matthias said, this talk will be about uh, assemblies and the motivation came a bit from this part that many of you may be seen, the first 3D printed fl flying part that was developed at Airbus and which re replaced an existing part. And because it was a part replacement, um, the connection to the existing part was of course fixed and thereby restricted the design freedom. And moreover, if you only uh, look at a single part itself, you have the risk that you optimize the part, but uh, the, the result is in general worse for the whole assembly because the attached part for the attached part, it's maybe more critical that you have an increase of stiffness here. And that's what motivated us to um, optimize parts as an assembly together. So simultaneously optimize two parts with topology optimization and at the same time optimize the connections, the location of their connections. So here, the, as I said, the parts are parameterized by density. So we have a typical ZIMP approach for topology optimization here. And um, the, the location of these joints is restricted to this box in this case, but in general, there's an upper and lower bound. So these are our design variables, the locations and the densities um, for each joint. And we have per part a volume constraint, which could also be formulated for the whole assembly, but this is what we picked here. And then we have a um, equilibrium condition that I will talk about on the next slide in detail. And what we will later see that it's also necessary to have a minimum distance um, constraint for these joints. And we, when we impose a minimum distance, we approximate the reciprocal of the distance by, by a P norm. And the objective is the compliance here. And in some cases later, I will look at the worst case compliance. So uh, looking at a fail safe optimization where the worst, so the maximum compliance of the failure cases, namely that the joints may fail will be considered and for that then we use a KS function to approximate the maximum. So looking closer at this um, equilibrium system, the stiffness matrix is composed of the stiffnesses of this uh, material fields, let's say, or density fields. That's why we call it KM. And it can be more than two. So that's why it can be multiple matrices here. We have the stiffnesses of these joints, which are quite small matrices, which are which you find here. And then these um, bolts or this, this stiffness of these joints are a mesh independently connected to the density fields. And that is uh, captured by this coupling terms. And the coupling term, of course, uh, depends on the location of the joints and this material matrix, uh, the material stiffness depends on the densities, but also on the location of the joints. So how does this connection here exactly look like? That's um, on the next slide. Yeah, it of course, depends on what kind of connection you're looking at. If it's what more a point-wise connection, like a, a spot weld or a rivet or a bolt or a, a screw. Um, it, but in any case, we always define a red region where the parts are connected through spring elements. Yeah, these springs connect the two parts and can be somewhere in the mesh. So mesh independently coupled and also coupled, always coupled to the uh, nodes of the elements they are in. And when they come too close to one element, we also check the, the neighboring elements to couple that. And um, yeah, so that's always this red region, which is basically the load transfer region. But this, uh, we also need this green region, which defines where in the material density field, we have a non-design space, namely a, a full non-design space, yeah, where there's always material and then a void design space. So how does that work in, in detail? For topology optimization, we use a standard approach 
uh, with a density a filter, a variable filter, and then a heavy side um, projection, heavy side approximation projection. And at the same time, we have the joint position. And this joint defines where we have a mask that we then multiply to the uh, projected density to get the modified density and thereby ensure that um, in the in the region where we have this joint, we always have a, a solid region and a whole region where this depends on the joint type. And if you have multiple joints, um, this mask just has multiple holes, so you have the same number of operations. And thereby the position of the joint influences the stiffness matrix uh, of the yeah, density field. Um, at the same time, we have the stiffness of the joints, which is kept constant, and then the coupling terms, which of course depend also on the location, and all goes together into this stiffness matrix, the global one. So let's already go to some results. As a reference, we look at the cantilever beam. Um, yeah, here loaded, and then a classical result. And now what happens if we say we have two parts that are overlapping here, and now we look first at two joints, which initially are located at these green spots. And the optimizer then moves this location of the non-design spaces and we get a design with two connections. And if you plot that separately, you see that you get two designs, two parts that are connected. If um, you don't consider this bold type con uh, connection, but more uh, spot-like connection, connection, it looks very similar. So generally the findings were not too different if the size is similar. So therefore in the following, we will mainly look at this part. And then you can look at the compliance. The compliance of course increases when you have these bolts uh, introduced or these connections. Um, and the nice thing is we can here distinguish what the contribution of the density fields and what the contribution of the stiffness, which is uh, with the joints, sorry, which is also always very low. Um, compared to the, this material. Yes, and of course it slightly increases when we introduce joints. Now what happens if we uh, have more joints? If we say we have four, then it's these, we pick this four blue spots as initial guess. And then what comes out of the optimization is the same. So the optimizer just places the bold locations on top of each other, um, unless you restrict the distance that these joints must have. And then you get a very nice design here. Um, and if you then look at it separately, you see that these regions are not connected to the rest. So obviously we really don't need four bolts here. There's no benefit um, of it. And the optimizer just parks these uh, connection where in the reference configuration without, which is just one part. And we anyway had a, a light, slight hole here. Yeah, so the optimizer always knows how to trick us. The um, compliance again increases a bit if you introduce more bolts, of course. Um, yeah, so, but we thought there might be situations where you want to have four bolts because you have some redundancy, but then you of course have to ask that explicitly in the optimization and we set up a fail safe objective. So worst case compliance was optimized and then uh, you end up with a design where indeed these all these locations of the bolts are connected, and uh, the compliance is of, is again worse than in this case. But the fail safe compliance or the worst case compliance is only slightly increased because you have a lot of redundancy here. Um, yeah. Finally, I want to show a three D example, which uh, maybe shows best why this makes sense to do. So if you have this design space here, this block, and you pull on top, and you only consider this part, um, you would get a straight bar as optimum result, right? So here we considered a plate, which we optimized simultaneously with this block, and four nodes that can move in this plane. Um, and these at these four locations, we again have this full design, uh, non-design space, the empty non-design space, and on top of the bolts also a non-design space to ensure accessibility of these bolts. And that's what the result then looks like. You see a bit this influence of the non-design space on top here, and the optimizer tries to push the load to the edges of this plate and is not producing a, a straight line. And also here we played around with worst case scenarios 
then the bolts move a bit more together. You have a more closed design. And um, obviously the compliance is increasing when you have fail safe um, requirements, but uh, then also the fail safe uh, performance is of course better. So I'm already at the end and want to have some concluding remarks. You might say it's not satisfying to prescribe the number of joints, right? It might be nicer to, to leave it up to the optimizer to tell us how many joints we have. Yeah, if you use this approach, what you can always do is put a lot of joints and then the optimizer will tell you if uh, they are not necessary like here. And there are already um, publications where it has been suggested to use um, a spring pattern where the stiffness of the spring is penalized in a zim type approach. And then, yeah, you get the number of springs at the end that you need. But we found this, we also tried to embed that here and found it to be very sensitive to the ratio of the spring stiffness and the density, the stiffness of the density fields. And um, you may, might end up with having half joints at the end because you penalize them. And for some reason, it's not, um, been, uh, uh, yeah, unbeneficial, I don't know if it's a word, to, to have uh, only a half joint. That, that's why we followed this approach at the end. And the obvious next step is of course, to consider strength here. And then easiest way to do that is to make a, a constraint on the forces that are transferred through the bolts. That is not part of the paper, but Olaf has already done it. And the design then looks like this. Um, it's even nicer because also these um, density fields have some redundancy here and here. Um, but of course, that also depends on how the load, uh, the maximum load of uh, the joints is defined. Uh, if it's too high, you get the same thing as here again. And just a final remark, we also looked at an L-beam and that also brought some funny results, which you can find in the paper. Finally, I just want to acknowledge the funding sources and that's already the end of my talk within 12 minutes. Excellent timing, Benedict. Thanks a lot. And uh, also nice that you uh, that you put in a little teaser of the L bracket, but without mentioning what was so funny about it. Maybe somebody will ask, but maybe there are also some other questions. So uh, to all, feel free to open your mic and ask a question or type your question uh, in the chat, whatever you prefer. Okay, I could ask one uh, nice results, Benedict. Uh, I was just maybe I didn't pay pay fully attention. So your your hinges or your uh, connections they transfer moment also. Yes. Yes. So could you do it without transferring moment? So just having yes. a real hinge. Is yeah. That... Yeah. Olaf was already pushing uh, to look at compliant mechanisms yeah. uh, and and using the hinge this as hinges uh, and to place them in, in in the location where you want. Yeah. That, that's generally possible. But then somehow you would need to make a more advanced spring model that, that couples degrees of freedom or something like that. Well, yeah. I wouldn't say more advanced, right? I mean, it's quite simple. To, I mean, you couldn't use this type of pattern. You would probably use, use a more simple um, model. Here we, we distributed uh, multiple springs over the whole, oh, sorry, that was um, over this whole area. But you could also, of course, also just take one spring, oh, okay. and, and then yeah. it would make it very. That's actually what they do in aircraft industry, right? So, okay. And and then it would be easy. Otherwise, yet in, indeed, you would have to come up with something. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. So if you want it to have a physical extension, you would have to come up with something more advanced. But but yeah, I see. Yeah. It. yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Benedict, can can I ask? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I sort of mean it as a challenge. Do you, do you think contact contact should be relevant in something like this eventually uh, or, or, or no? Uh, um, that's a good question. So of course that makes things a bit more difficult and we also spend some time on thinking about this. And um, if you introduce contact, you might not need these um, non-design spaces here because you automatically would, you know, the optimizer would see that there's some material necessary in order to transfer a, a tension load. Um, 
So th that's kind of something we can avoid by, by using this type of approach. Of course, it can always be more accurate with contact, but you know, it's all also getting more challenging. Yeah. Yes, no, no, I, I, yeah, and like I said, I mean it as a, as a bit of a devil's advocate. I, yeah, no, contact makes it horrible. Yeah, no, no, I, I yeah. Okay, I think uh, given the time, we only have three minutes for the questions immediately after the talks. So we have to leave it at this. There were more questions raised in the in the chat, but at the end of the session, uh, there will be opportunity to ask more questions to Benedict. So thanks again, uh, Benedict. And then we move to the next speaker, and that will be uh, Holly Smith. You are still muted. Sorry, took me a moment to find the unmute button. <laughs> so hello, everyone. I'd like to thank the hosts for putting together this webinar and for inviting me to talk. And I'd also like to thank the Office of Naval Research for funding this work. Uh, so I'm presenting on a recent work done by myself and my PhD advisor, Julian Narado uh, at UConn to perform topology optimization with discrete geometric components, which are made of composite materials. Uh, so I've organized the presentation into four parts. I'll begin with the motivation behind the work, and then I'll give an overview of our feature mapping approach, followed by some examples, and then I'll close with some conclusions drawn from this work. Uh, so our motivation is to consider design with long fiber reinforced components. Uh, for example, the carbon fiber rods, which are depicted here, made from a pultrusion process, uh, or laminated plates. And so continuous fiber reinforced materials generally exhibit superior mechanical properties compared to short discontinuous fiber reinforcement. However, they are more difficult to manufacture, uh, and the fabrication of structures with long continuous fiber reinforcement lends itself to geometric primitives like bars and plates. Uh, in our review of the literature, uh, we were unable to find any methods that are able to find the optimal layout of geometric primitives, such as bars and plates, which are fiber reinforced uh, within a 3D envelope. So this motivated us to extend the geometry projection method uh, to support geometric components with anisotropic materials. Uh, so here I show a video to demonstrate the design evolution of a topology optimization using the geometry projection framework. So the design variables uh, they define a series of bars which are able to move around in space. And in this work, the composite bars are reinforced along their major axis. Uh, and thus they're significantly stiffer in the axial direction than the transverse direction. And as such, they're compliant in bending, uh, but stiff in axial loading. So we define the geometric primitive for a bar as an offset segment. Uh, that means all points within a radius RB of the medial segment are solid. And this segment is parametrized in terms of its endpoints. Uh, we map the geometry to a density field by computing uh, density field rho b for each bar as a smooth heavy side of the sine distance to the bar's boundary. Note that because we define a density field, we don't need to remesh, but we can use a fixed mesh as in density based topology optimization. So after computing a density field for each bar, we then define an effective density by weighing it by a size variable alpha. Uh, then we combine the density by computing a smooth maximum of this effective density. So undepicted on the left, uh, it shows how the size variable is used in our approach as densities are in a density-based topology optimization. Uh, what I mean by this is that the size variable is penalized in the spirit of SIMP. Uh, so when it's used to interpolate material properties, intermediate values are structurally inefficient, and the optimizer is encouraged to produce designs that either include or exclude each geometric component. Notably for this work, uh, the P norm and KS functions that we've used for isotropic materials in the past uh, to compute the smooth maximum is no longer compatible with anisotropic materials. And to remedy this situation, we use the softmax function, which I defined here. Uh, this function computes a smooth maximum as a linear combination. And importantly, the weights W in the linear combination, uh, can, they can be used to combine the properties of the constituent elements. Uh, the reinforcing fibers, again, are along, aligned along the axis of each bar. 
And this means that as the bars change orientation in space, uh, we have to also reorient the material properties. So in the figure to the right, uh, I denote the bar coordinates with primes and the global coordinates are unprimed. And so the, com the coordinates uh, transformation matrix R between the global and the uh, bar coordinate system are just the dot products of the orthonormal basis vectors for the two coordinate systems. Uh, and we can transform the components of the elasticity tensor according to the tensor transformation rule. Uh, and it's important to note, because the bar coordinates are design dependent, the material properties for each bar also depend on the design. Uh, and so in the paper, we provide the sensitivities of the bar coordinate basis vectors to the design variables. Uh, to interpolate the material properties, uh, again, we use these weights from the softmax function. Uh, and these weights form a convex combination, which means they're all positive and they add up to one. And this renders a strict interpolation of the constituent properties. Uh, the figure on the left um, is intended to demonstrate the role of the softmax parameter P. So as we increase this parameter, uh, the weights form a one-hot vector. And that means a single weight approaches one, while the rest approach zero. And the size variable is what's used to control which component dominates intersections. So in this figure, we're interpolating the RGB color values assigned to each bar in the same way that we interpolate material properties. So this is uh, to allow you to visualize, um, for example, with a softmax parameter of 10, even when the size variables um, are only 1% different, we have a unit size variable and 0.99, that with the softmax parameter of 10, we still have a significant amount of mixing when interpolating the material properties. However, for a larger softmax parameter of 100, uh, even when the size variables are only 1% different, uh, it's clearly the intersection is dominated by the unit size variable. Now, increasing this parameter does come at the cost of increased nonlinearity, but in our experiments, the softmax parameter of 100 uh, did not cause any issues with convergence. For our numerical examples, we consider two different materials, a carbon fiber reinforced polymer, or CFRP, which has transversely isotropic properties, as well as aluminum, which is isotropic. Uh, to compare the designs, we first optimize for each material from an arbitrary initial design, which we choose just to be a, a uniformly spaced grid of plates, uh, sorry, bars. And then we take the optimized design for each material and swap it to the other material. And then we perform a secondary optimization uh, with a swapped design as our new initial design. All right, the MBB beam is our first example. Uh, and in this case, we have a single point load. And so uh, our expectation in this case is that all the bars will essentially be two force members, either in tension or compression. And we predict that the fiber reinforced bars should then behave similarly to the isotropic aluminum bars. So here I have a video of the optimization for both materials. And the objective function is just a log scale value of the compliance. And I plot this below uh, and circling the current design point in the design evolution. For all of our examples, we minimize compliance subject to a volume constraint. And we also have bounds on the design variables. So as you can see, these designs are not quite the same. And the question we need to then answer is, are these designs just two different local minima, which would perform well for both materials, or if they're significantly different somehow? And again, for the MBB, game, MBB beam, which only has a single point load, we expect this similar design uh, will work well for both materials. All right, so to answer this question, we performed um, a swap of the materials and then the subsequent optimization. And the results from those numerical exper experiments are plotted here for a sweep of different volume fractions ranging from 0.2 to 0.4. Uh, for aluminum, we also performed an additional optimization using the top 88 code and setting the filter radius to match the minimum bar radius so that we can compare the performance um, using the geometry projection to a freeform density-based topology optimization. Now the colors in these density plots uh, correspond to the orientation of the interpolated material. And I'll refer you to the paper for more details on that. Uh, and although the designs are not identical for both materials, they do perform similarly when we swap the materials. And this indicates um, that the local minima that we found all perform similarly, 
And it confirms our expectation that the MBB beam designs that are optimized for either material uh, perform well when we swap the materials. And furthermore, especially at the higher volume fractions, uh, the geometry projection results uh, perform almost as well as the density-based results from top 88. In our second example, we chose a bridge design. Uh, and this has a distributed load, so we expect some members will be in bending. Uh, and again, the CFRP material is significantly more compliant under a transverse load. So we expect the design optimized for the, op uh, for the isotropic aluminum, which can carry bending more efficiently, will likely perform worse when we swap that to a CFR mat CFRP material uh, compared to if we had designed for CFRP directly. And actually this approach of designing for aluminum and then swapping it for a carbon fiber is known in the aerospace industry as the black aluminum design. Uh, so this plot is the same format as for the MBB beam, uh, but we can confirm our prediction that the black aluminum designs uh, do perform poorly compared to the designs that are optimized for CFRP directly. And we also continue to observe that the local minima that we obtain do perform similarly, and that the performance using the geometry projection for aluminum is again similar, although slightly higher, uh, or slightly worse than the freeform density-based approach. Our uh, third example is a 3D cantilever with three different load cases. The first and second loads are point loads at the tip of the cantilever. And the third load is a torsion load uh, around the central cross section. So here I illustrate the same optimization and then the material swap and the subsequent optimization, as well as a density-based design uh, to compare to the geometry projection. And we see a similar trend uh, as to the bridge example, where the black aluminum design, which I circle here, uh, it performs with a much higher compliance, so much worse than the designs that are optimized directly for the CFRP material. And notably in 3D, the geometry projection with bars uh, generally exhibits worse performance as compared to the density-based design. Uh, and this is most significant for the third load case, which is the torsion load. Uh, and the, the torsion load really takes advantage of this thin shell-like structure, which we can't produce by a small number of discrete bars. All right, so to conclude, uh, this is the first topology optimization method that we know of uh, for composites that are made of geometric primitives, uh, such as bars, or uh, in the future, we want to look into plates. And this is specifically targeted towards long fiber reinforced materials uh, because again, uh, the manufacturing process lends itself to geometric primitives. Uh, and finally, we showed that except for the most simple loading scenario where all members are effectively two force members, the black aluminum design approach is suboptimal. And there's a clear benefit to optimizing directly for the composite material. All right, thank you. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. And also thank you again for also staying within time. So we have time for some questions. Who can I invite uh, for a question for Hollis? Yes, maybe I can start. Uh, thank you, Hollis, for the presentation. Uh, I'm wondering, when, when you get this uh, 3D geometry, how to fabricate that with composites, especially concerning the joints? You mentioned that you want to fabricate with uh, continuous fiber. I'm curious how that can be achieved. Right, so the way that we are thinking to manufacture here would be you would have to cut one member uh, and then use, for example, adhesive to attach. Um, and at this point, we haven't modeled uh, the joining process, but that is something that we're looking into. Yeah, perhaps you should have a chat with Benedict because uh, <laughs> that nicely connects uh, to the previous talk. Other questions? Maybe Hello. a question then from, uh, from my side. Uh, Hollis, you mentioned plates in the beginning, but it did, the topic did not come back. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Because there you would have an additional design variable in, in the plane, basically, to orient the fibers. Right. So that's actually part of ongoing work that we're doing now. Uh, so for this initial paper, we just looked into um, unidirectional fiber reinforced bars. Uh, but we have actually published um, unidirectional fiber reinforced uh, plate design um, for the IDETC conference uh, this last summer. 
And we're currently looking into designing the layup of the laminates as a design variable. Okay, cool. So that's uh, coming up. Mm -hmm. um, maybe time for a quick question. Yeah, maybe could I ask? Yes, please. Yeah. I saw the, the, the topology from the, this per, ge geometric projection is uh, some, somehow different with the traditional uh, thing or density based matter. So, is there some, I would say, so it's due to the projection to, from a plantation point of view, is the, the design space become very complex. So, so, so then the optimization becomes difficult. Even you, you can get a simple maybe modeling of this geometry. Do you have some any comments, uh, particularly for this uh, anisotropic material? Yeah, case. Um, so in terms of the design space, when we have the, the geometric primitives, we end up having um, much fewer design variables, right? Because you just have the, for example, here, the endpoints of the plates, as long as they're uh, radius, or, sorry, the bars. Uh, and so uh, you end up falling into certainly uh, many more local minima. Uh, but as we observed here for the um, compliance minimization, all of these local minima tend to perform similarly. So does that answer your question? Yeah, you have fewer design, uh, design variables, but, uh, but uh, maybe the design space become complicated. It, it, this is my, my, my guess. I'm not sure because of using these projections, uh, that you, you sometimes you get very strange topologies. I don't know if you have this experience or not. So this is not so, so how to say it's like the traditional thing, but we can always get a very well converged design. But for this projection, sometimes if the initial design is not so good, and sometimes you are stuck in some very strange local optimum. I don't know if you have this experience or not. This is my question. Thank you. Yes, uh, so there is definitely a strong dependence on the initial layout. Uh, but what we have found is that starting, uh, for example, with a a regular grid that sort of covers the design space uh, generally leads to uh, a good design in the end. Uh, okay, we also have to this, use... Uh, thank you for this insight. Okay. I think we have to leave it at this for now. Maybe we can continue discussion uh, later because we uh, it's time to move to the third uh, presentation. Thanks again, Hollis. Thank and, you. Uh, please, uh, uh, Jebuk, it's your turn to share the screen. Okay. Uh, okay. I will start uh, my presentation. So uh, this presentation is about uh, uh, spatially bearing isotropic impure structures, and I'm Jeng Wee and uh, Mr. Kwon, uh, Professor Yu Min, and uh, Dr. Nomura, and they, they are the co-authors of this work. Uh, okay. So the first part is the introduction. So the goal of this study is the design and fabrication of the shell of porous impure structures. And this uh, shell impure is uh, a biomimetic structure that exists in nature. It is well-known structure. And uh, the advantage of this structure is known uh, to be uh, superior energy absorption ability, uh, high stress strength rate ratio and structural robustness. And this study uh, deals with a uh, graded infill uh, that has uh, spatially varying uh, infill densities and orientations, as you can see in this figure, not just uh, uniform uh, impure, homogeneous impure structures. So uh, the topology optimization uh, for uh, the shared impure structure uh, consists of uh, two uh, design schemes. First for a uh, coated macrostructure design and second for uh, the graded forest impure. And for the coated macrostructure uh, design, uh, various approaches has been proposed and these uh, approaches, they aim to identify the boundary of the macrostructure, uh, which will be designed as the coated region. So, uh, and and the second uh, the scheme is for the design of the graded infill, uh, porous infill structures. And a great number of researches have been uh, proposed for the infill design. 
And I think they may be uh, classified into the three uh, categories. The first category, I think the first category it, uh, utilized the local or volume constraint. And uh, it is a straightforward single scale approach for this computational cost will be very high for the high resolution MP case. That means the uh, small size MP case. And I think the second uh, category is the concurrent uh, topology optimization. And it has uh, abundant uh, design flexibility, uh, but its computational cost is relatively high and uh, it has an issue in structural connection. And I think the third uh, category is the homogenization uh, based multi scale approach. And it is computationally efficient, uh, but it requires the additional uh, procedure uh, called that, referred as uh, dehomogenization uh, to restore, to regenerate the impure uh, structure. So uh, in this study, uh, we proposed the sequential uh, design procedures of the shared MP structure for additive manufacturing. So as you can see in this figure, uh, the proposed approach is uh, based on the homogenization based multi-scale uh, approach. So uh, it is composed of uh, pre-processing for asymptotic homogenization and main processing and the post-processing. And finally, uh, we can get uh, uh, coated uh, structure uh, with the uh, impure, post impure in a CAD format. And this result can be uh, fabricated using the additive manufacturing. And this work is uh, just limited in the, just a two dimensional or uh, single load problem. And the key ideas of the proposed uh, design procedure is twofold. So the first idea is for the design of the coated macrostructure. So we propose the sequential, just a straightforward sequential post-processing uh, procedure for the coated design. And this uh, uh, simple approach may be uh, suitable for uh, if the graded impure structure is the main portion. Instead, instead of a coated region of the macrostructure coated region. And the second idea is for the impure uh, microstructure design. And in this study, uh, the osotropic impure uh, microstructure is restored uh, using the rotated rectangular void holes instead, instead of the implicit density field uh, used to, in the previous work. So when using uh, this uh, uh, explicit rotated uh, uh, rectangular geometry, uh, the design results uh, becomes very easy to handle uh, and it becomes uh, suitable for additive manufacturing. So next, uh, I will uh, briefly, let me briefly explain the formulations of the two key ideas. So the first formulation is for the design of coated macrostructure. So we proposed the sequential simple post-processing for coated design. And the motivation of this uh, simple approach is that the simultaneous design of coated macrostructure and infill densities may cause the zero one convergence problem as you can see in these figures. And I think this uh, problem may be due to the ambiguity uh, between the uh, macrostructure density low and microstructure or whole size variables. Uh, these two variables both uh, determines the constitutive tensor together. And, and in addition, the, uh, in the simultaneous approach, the coating region uh, may cause the sudden change in material property, which, is, which may be the another region of this uh, convergence problem. So uh, to resolve this problem, I just apply a very simple approach that is just a, a sequential approach. So uh, the macrostructure design is first uh, uh, performed, first determined, and the boundary is identified from this design result uh, using this formulation. And the microstructure whole sizes uh, at the boundary is forced to be zero. Uh, that means the boundary region uh, is set as just a, a poor solid material. 
And uh, next, uh, uh, as a second idea, we proposed the uh, dehomogenization scheme using uh, the rotated rectangular. And this idea is motivated from this original microstructure used for the homogenization. As you can see, there is a rectangular, uh, rotated rectangular void holes here. So we use this uh, uh, void hole uh, to uh, regenerate these uh, limpid structures. So uh, this approach can easily handle uh, the, the high resolution limpid structure as you can see in this figure. And the meshing of the design results uh, is relatively easy. Uh, this is required for the reanalysis of the uh, design result. So uh, in this, uh, this is a formulation for the de homogenization. So uh, first, uh, the centroid location of this rectangular void hole is obtained, is, is determined from the microstructure orientation field uh, using this complex formulation uh, together with the image processing. Then uh, the infill structure is generated uh, by removing this, just simply removing this rectangular void holes uh, from the macrostructure. Uh, the next part is the numerical examples. So the first example is the MVB beam design problem. So uh, here are the design domain with boundary conditions and loading conditions. And this figure uh, shows the uh, multi-scale topology optimization results. And this color represents uh, the microstructure density, uh, which is uh, determined from the void sizes. And this uh, arrow uh, represents the, op uh, the optimizer's orientation of rectangular void holes. And after uh, simple post-processing, uh, the, the coated design is obtained like this figure. And, uh, and the, after the homogenization, the MP structure is restored from just uh, this uh, density distributions. And if you compare uh, the compliance and volume fraction values before and after the dehomogenization, the values are very close. Uh, this means that the restored, the impure structure uh, is convincing. And this is a CAD model prepared for additive manufacturing, uh, which is simply obtained uh, by extruding this final result. And here are uh, the various de uh, design results with uh, different parameters. Uh, so the upper three results are obtained in different number of cell for unit lengths. So uh, we can see that proposed explicit uh, dehomogenization may not be uh, preferable for this low resolution MPS structure. That means a low number of uh, unit cell case but it might be good for this high resolution case. And, and this, this might be because this, uh, this approach cannot generate the curved, curved structure uh, that can be done in the uh, implicit density field approach. But uh, the proposed approach may be good for this high resolution case. And, and the lower uh, three results are obtained in different limits of the uh, uh, different limit of void hole sizes. And you can see that the uh, proposed scheme can handle well uh, this case with wide range of uh, impedance from uh, the poor solid to the near to uh, the void, uh, the void uh, impure. And the second uh, example is the design of back crank. And here is the uh, design domain with boundary and loading condition. And this is the uh, the impure density and orientation distribution. And this is the final uh, design result uh, in the CAD, CAD format. And after obtaining the CAD model uh, of the design result, it's a uh, reanalysis can be performed uh, uh, like this. And in addition, the CAD model can be very easily uh, fabricated using the additive manufacturing uh, thanks to the explicit just simple uh, MP structure representation. And here are the informations about uh, additive manufacturing for, uh, and the printing materials. And the uh, next uh, back rank design with various loading conditions obtained like these figures and uh, this table uh, summarizes the loading conditions used for uh, each case. 
So this is the end of this presentation. So thank you for your attention. So if you have any questions, yeah, please let me know. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation and also nice to see the, the physical prototype uh, that you showed at the end. So indeed we have time for questions. Who can I invite uh, for a question? Okay, no immediate questions. Oh, Yun has a question. And maybe I can start. Um, I'm wondering, so it looks to me that the position of the rectangles are sampled from a regular grid. I'm just wondering whether it makes sense to slightly optimize the position of the small rectangles to, to make the pattern more regular? So if you, if, for instance, if you look at this picture, you, mm -hmm. you cut out many rotated rectangular shapes. Mm -hmm. And then the, the, the central point of each rectangular shape is in a regular grade. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sorry. Wondering. Uh, yeah, I, I, actually, I don't understand your question exactly. So, so how, how do you decide the, the, the position of the rectangular shape? The holes, I guess. Yeah. The holes, right. yeah. Yeah. How, how, do you, uh, how do you decide the center of the holes? Uh, uh, how, how your question may be about the central location of the rectangular, yeah. if, is it correct? Yes. Yeah, it's... Uh, uh, it, it follows uh, existing approach, uh, the density field, uh, density based approach. So it, it determines from this uh, orientation field. So direction, or direction of the, uh, it determines from the uh, direction of the, uh, where is, uh, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I understand how you rotate it, but <laughs> where it should be located? Where, where is it the center? Uh, the center is located, uh, it, it is determined from this, uh, the orientation. So it, it, it is just uh, uh, very smooth, smoothly determined, the smooth, smoothly determined from the orientation field. So uh, it follows just, uh, okay, yeah, it, it's very uh, complex formulation. Actually, it, it, it is just uh, using this formulation. So uh, it's very high. Yeah, it is just uh, very similar to the pre, uh, existing approach uh, proposed by uh, Dr. Groen. Yeah, it's very close. Could, could you go back two slides? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, one more. Yeah, the one on the top right. I see the, the mm -hmm. uh, could you go <laughs> in the previous one? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so here on the top right side, the, mm -hmm. the center of each, it, it looks to me that all the arrows are centered in a regular grid. Yes, right, yeah, regular it's regular, regular. yeah. And but from this center, is not regular, yeah. And from that center, you rotate your, your, your holes, right? I'm just curious whether it makes sense to slightly change the location in a post-process optimization, mm -hmm. whether that uh, will make the final shape more regular. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, this is the central location, so it's not regular grade. And if if the if I if I uh, yeah, it is just a smoothly uh, oh. moving like this. Yeah, it is determined from this orientation field uh, for the smooth changing of this uh, central location. Yeah. I think uh, I think we have to leave it here for now. This this, this Sorry, discussion. So indeed. <laughs> This, discussion, this question grew into quite a discussion. Maybe we can continue it uh, towards the end, but we have to stick also to the to the program. But thank you again, uh, Jaybook, for the interesting yeah, talk. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, when I look at your results, uh, what, what, what I see is also these continuous lines, th these patterns that emerge that, that to me look like deposition patterns that you could use in a, in a printing process. And I think that is a nice connection to the next, uh, the next presentation by uh, Mathilde. If you could uh, start sharing your screen, yeah. Because now we will look at the different aspect of additive manufacturing and include also uh, process parameters. Um, can you see my my screen? Yes. All right. Um, 
So thank you very much for inviting me to present the work uh, I've been doing during my PhD with Grégoire Aller and Christophe Tournier about coupling structural optimization and trajectory optimization methods for additive manufacturing, and especially for palabet fusion processes. So maybe just to, um, well, to give some context, this is a process in which the object is built layer by layer with metallic powder. And so for each layer, you put some powder and then you melt and then you put some powder and then you melt with a heat source. And actually the heat source, um, well, to melt, you, you choose a scanning path that the heat source is gonna travel along. And this scanning path is very important because it um, gives the temperature distribution um, during the building, which gives the thermal expansion and then residual stresses. And thus this affects the final quality of the objects you have built. And so, the question, well, here are some of the scanning paths that exist and that are used or at least developed in literature. Uh, so you have several kind of, of paths, but what we decided to, to, well, the first question we wanted uh, starting this PhD is how to use shape optimization to facilitate the, well, the job of the heat source traveling along the scanning path. Basically, can we design correctly the parts we want to build so that um, the scanning path we're using will give some good results without introducing too many um, residual stresses or defects. And because the question of scanning, what a good scanning path is, was a bit complicated, we decided to um, first um, try to, to, to build an algorithm to optimize the path from scratch and then try it on different shapes to, give some, to get some intuition on how the path and the part are related and then put this algorithm into a bigger one to run some concurrent optimization between the part shape and the scanning path. And here are some references, um, um, uh, uh, well, some papers that have been working on the same kind of subject, mostly on the first one, but this one, have been, they have been working also on the second point. Uh, well, brief overview of this talk, I will first talk about the modeling assumptions that we have made, then on, one, on the one hand, um, the algorithm for the scanning path optimization, on the other hand, part optimization, and then mixing all together um, for a concurrent optimization. So part of that fusion process is a quite complicated one with many phenomena um, involved, and especially four states considered, powder solid, liquid, and gaseous. And the problem with liquid and gaseous states is that they involve fluid mechanics, which is um, very expensive to, to, well, to solve. So since we're doing optimization, we want to iterate. So we'll have to compute several times um, to solve several times the equations. And we have to focus on macro scale modeling only with two states considered. So we assume that we're gonna switch, well, suddenly uh, from powder to solid. But that's not that bad because we can still control thermal expansion and residual stresses. So we go further in the assumptions, assuming that the source is traveling that so fast that uh, it's as the whole source, the whole scanning path was switched on at once. So basically, um, our source is now represented by a Dirac function of the path. And then we want to compute the temperature. Well, we consider only conduction and that there is a second assumption here, which is that we compute the temperature only in a two dimensional, um, well, in a plane, which is the layer plane. And we're only losing the conduction on the vertical axis, but we're adding here a temperature loss um, term well, to model this. And then the optimization problem is to minimize the length of the scanning path so that within the part that we want to build, so DS, uh, the temperature is gonna go above a change of state temperature. Of course, we want the powder to be melted. Out of this DS part, we want the powder to remain under a maximum temperature, which is itself under um, the change of state temperature. And we assume that we can control the quality by controlling the temperature within the S, um, well, saying that we want this temperature to remain under a maximum temperature. Of course, that's simplified, but that is a very good first step to set an algorithm that, and then we could complexify um, the model. And so we transform these inequality constraints into, well, differentiable equality constraints. So here is the optimization problem we will focus on. Second step is scanning path optimization. So we want to do some gradient descent. So we need the gradients and we're using for this shape differentiation theory. So basically we will try to compute how does the optimization problem vary uh, when we are uh, moving the path. Well, uh, that's very nice because we have some formula for that. 
And so we can do a gradient descent. And uh, the constraints that we had in the optimization problem are included into um, the algorithm through an augmented Lagrangian method. Well, then we have some coding details that I will not talk about, and we get to the we go to the results. So we're trying different initializations on different objects. We are assuming that the metal we are um, considering is aluminum, which has a very high conductivity. And uh, we want the temperature here to be within the object between green and orange. Red would be too hot, and blue means that we have not melted the powder. So we run the optimizations and we get, well, a lot of results. So the first conclusion is that the results depend on the initialization. And actually we have several local minima to this problem. Um, a second thing that we have to notice is that, well, actually there is a link um, between um, the shape of the part to build and the path. Because for example, you see that on the last figure, whatever initialization we're choosing, we can never build this bar because it is too thin, actually. Of course, if we were putting a straight line here, well, some path here, um, because the conductivity is too high, we would be melting too much of these two holes. So it ha this has been uh, prohibited by the optimization. So to see if it's, I mean, really true or if we're just, um, well, that's only some assumptions, but we have to keep trying to understand better. So we try another metal, which is the titanium, and which has a very, well, uh, low conductivity, or at least much lower than the aluminum. And same kind of tests, and here are the results we get. So first of all, it seems that, um, well, it, it is a little more complicated than it was for the aluminum. Uh, low conductivity complicates the optimization. Then we still have this dependence of the results um, to the initialization. And something that is interesting is that on this last figure, we see that at least for this result, we have we, we are able now to build this very thin bar. Because of course, since the conductivity is lower, when we put a straight line here, we're melting a thinner part than we were before, and we are not melting too much of the holes, so it's fine. On the other hand, this, this figure is very large. So since the conductivity is, well, is small, then we have uh, we, we require a very longer path than it was um, than we needed in the, for the aluminum, and so that complicates the optimization. So it seems that there is a real link between um, well the part shape, the scanning path, and the metal conductivity. Well, that's for um, the scanning path optimization, and now the part. Well, must uh, well you all know that, so it's only to present the problem that uh, I'm considering here. So we want to minimize the compliance with the volume constraint and uh, under a very classic elastic, uh, elasticity problem. And we are, well, considering once again, um, a gradient descent algorithm using shape differentiation theory. And we represent the boundary of the shape uh, with a level set that is gonna move, um, well, on a fixed mesh. So, well, that's just to illustrate what happens when we optimize. And now we put everything together. So we have a new optimization problem that involves, well, in blue, what came from part optimization and in orange, what came from, what, what comes from path optimization. Um, there is one function in which part and path are both involved, which is the temperature constraint that we have here. Uh, well, for the concurrent algorithm, we basically um, differentiate with respect to the part and to the path each function, and then we can build a double loop algorithm that give some results. So the first results are for, well, still the cantilever, but with aluminum. Uh, here is the initialization we have given, and the first test consists in optimizing the part only without any temperature, um, well, considerations. And then we optimize the part, but taking into account the temperature, and we see that we already have a difference this bar was too thin, that's what we had seen before, too thin for aluminum. So here, well, the result is that we have a thicker bar. Then from here, we run the concurrent algorithm and we have an interesting result that I will comment later. Here is starting for this part, we optimize the path only, and then starting from there, we optimize both. So it seems that we still have uh, this interesting relation between 
thickness, part thickness, and path. Because you see that here, uh, well, here we could not build this one, so we had to make the bar thicker. If it is thicker, sometimes a straight line is enough to build the bar, so it's fine. And it's, if it's even thicker, we see that we have a sort of pattern that comes, which is a sort of omega patterns that we find here, but also here and on the other figures that seems to be adapted for this thickness. Uh, so that's a new, well, something new that um, says that what we thought before might not be, well, might be right and that we have to keep uh, looking into this direction. And then there is a last thing that we notice here is that the boundary of the shape adapts slightly here, but still adapts to the path. Um, we try um, with a lower conductivity with titanium, so that's the same, so part only, part but taking into consideration the temperature, and then both part on path, and then from for this part, path only, and then starting from there, both. And we see that we have the same kind of conclusions. So once again, we have this omega shape that appears. And we see that when we go even on a thicker part, we have a new sort of pattern that appears, which is a sort of wave pattern. And it's a lot clearer here. Um, well, the boundary really adapts to the path. Uh, so these results bring me to the conclusion which is that, um, well, it is important to consider both uh, the part to build and the path because actually they're really related and it's, it, it should be possible to improve um, the quality of the final object by optimizing both the path and the part to build. Because we see that we there is a relation between thickness, conductivity, part and path, and also because the boundary adapts to the path. So that 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 give well that open several perspectives because uh, we should run further tests. Of course, we could complexify the path optimization by well, for example, allowing um, the number of connected components of the path to be modified, and we can also um, well go to towards a more realistic um, model, like for example, um, considering the transient um, well. Um, transient states, like um, really assuming that the, the source is moving along the path and not having a steady state model, or um, really considering um, the residual stresses with the, the resolution of a mechanical problem and not only considering temperature and so on. And here are some references um, this work is based on. The three first one correspond to what I have presented and about path optimization without the steady state um, assumption, there is uh, this last one. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Well, I would be pleased to answer questions. Thank you for this uh, for this also very interesting and uh, original work. Uh, who can I invite uh, for a question? I have a question, Matthijs. John, go ahead. Uh, so thank you for this nice talk. So what I'm wondering is that you have shown some uh, typical scanning patterns like the parallel, spiral, and those kind of things in the beginning of your talk. I was wondering, uh, if you would just take a shape and if you would apply those different uh, typical scanning patterns with the assumption that you're turning on your heat sources simultaneously, would you be able to see a major differences in those different scanning patterns with this model? Yes, actually we are. When we, are, uh, when we try to optimize the path only, uh, well, there is this one, oh, I have presented the results in which we assume that we are in a steady state uh, case. And then we have optimized assuming, uh, without this assumption of, uh, of, of steady state, and the results are different. So I think that it makes, it makes a difference. But at an industrial scale, um, we have different types of technology for the heat source. And for example, um, we could not assume a steady, well, the, the steady state assumption is not valid for, um, for laser, um, if we are using a laser as a heat source, but if we're using an electron beam as a heat source, it moves a lot faster. And actually the steady state assumption is not, um, I mean, is not that wrong and can be, well, and the results we have could already been tested uh, with this kind of technology. So, so maybe I missed that, but the, the results that you have shown, are they with the steady state assumption yes, or without? they are. 
Yes, yes, they are. So all of them are with steady state. Okay. What I you. have cho shown, uh, they are with the steady state assumption. And if you want uh, without, well, you have to go to this article or to the PhD, but um, 12 minutes is too short. So. Okay. Thank Indeed, you. Uh, time is short. We're also already running out of time, I think, of the question part. Maybe a very quick question I, I'm curious about. You now consider it uh, like a, a melting process, right, with the electron or laser beam. Uh, what about the deposition process? Because there you have an additional constraint that you don't want to visit the same point twice, otherwise you get some sort of bump. So uh, no crossing constraint. Uh, would that be possible with this path optimization as well? I think it, well, we would have to add a constraint. So it means that we would have to require a constraint. But actually, uh, even if with the temperature, you know, um, if, we're, if you're putting correctly the temperature constraints, um, it has no interest into going twice at the same point. So you could force these constraints or you could hope that it would, well, come correctly happen. at yeah. first. I guess both should be required. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that insight. And uh, then we move to the, the final talk already of this, uh, of this session. And there's a change in program. Uh, there's a different speaker. Uh, Yunfeng Luo will be presenting uh, the final talk. Thank you for uh, jumping in at the final moment. You are still muted. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, can I share on my screen? Please do, yes. Yes, yeah, looks good. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Yun Feng Luo from Danen University of Technology. Uh, um, uh, and today, I will give this presentation on behalf of Pro Professor Liu. Uh, before uh, the presentation, I'd like to uh, say thanks to the organizers for inviting us to hear our work. And I also want to uh, say thanks to our co workers. Mm, uh, Professor Sigma from DTU and Dr. Lee from uh, the Central University and uh, Professor Liu from uh, Danny University of Technology. And, uh, and my topic today is about topology, uh, additive manufacturing oriented topologization of structures with self supported in closed voids. And uh, as you will know, uh, developing topologization for additive manufacturing has become an important research direction in the past several years. And so one of the uh, hottest directions is uh, to consider the additive manufacturing constraints in topologization, and such as some structural feature constraints and the performance constraints. And in this work, we mainly focus on uh, the overhang, uh, overhang restriction. The overhang issue here means the supports are required in overhang parts and, uh, uh, and the uh, post possession are, uh, are also required to remove, uh, to remove these supports. However, removing supports is uh, very tetrous and nebulous. And especially for this uh, type of enclosed voids and it's quite challenging to remove supports uh, in those enclosed voids. And to handle these issues, um, some researchers uh, focused, on, uh, focused, on to develop, uh, focused on developing self-supporting constraints. Uh, that is to control the overhaul angle uh, to be larger than a uh, uh, threshold angle, uh, generally uh, 45 degree. And uh, other, uh, the, uh, other uh, researchers uh, focused, on, uh, focused on connectivity constraint, where the enclosed vault is not allowed. And in this work, we proposed a new way, that is to, say, to control the minimum over hunger only in enclosed vault. The starting point of this new way is that the, to uh, remove the supports in the uh, open uh, regions is much easier than, than, than in the, than the uh, enclosed voids. So the uh, new way is a good compromise between manufacturability and the structural performance. So how to realize this idea? And, and our idea is uh, to constrain the length uh, of the overhaul interface in the enclosed voids to um, the other. And here the overhaul interface means 
the interface that requires support in additive manufacturing. Now, the um, main technology is to identify uh, the overhaul interface in enclosed world. This needs us to uh, uh, enclose, uh, identify the enclosed world and identify the overhaul interface. First, I'd I've, I've like to uh, introduce uh, a, a method called virtual temperature method to identify enclosed voids uh, proposed in 2015. And uh, uh, the idea is the solid is assumed to be uh, a no heat conductivity material, uh, while the void uh, uh, is, uh, uh, has high heat conductivity. And then we hit the void parts and, uh, you can imagine that the temperature in the enclosed voids will be um, will be not larger than, than that of uh, open regions. So by solving this um, virtual temperature uh, problem, the enclosed voids can be identified by the uh, by a proper temperature threshold to the other. Now and uh, uh, but however, uh, as you can see from this example. Uh, the temperature uh, varies greatly in different enclosed voids uh, by using the uh, virtual, uh, virtual temperature method. And if we use the T is bigger than T the other to identify the enclosed voids, then the choice of the T the other must be proper depend, depend, dependent. So how to de determine the uh, temperature depend uh, the temperature threshold is, uh, is, is challenging. Uh, in what to uh, handle this issue, we introduced, uh, uh, we proposed a uh, uh, nonlinear virtual temperature method by introducing um, a nonlinear uh, temperature dependent heat source. And the, uh, and the heat source, uh, and the relation between the heat source cool and the, the temperature uh, is, is shown here. And by solving this nonlinear uh, problem, the temperature in different enclosed voids uh, can be accurately controlled to a prescribed parameter Tmax here, and uh, and, and uh, by this way the temperature uh, the the temperature threshold can be easily uh, defined. Uh, in this work, we uh, use uh, uh, use the other as um, uh, uh, half Tmax, and this um, parameter is prescribed and the problem independent. And and next. Uh, I would like to introduce how to identify the overhaul interface. Uh, here we use the gradient uh, mass based method. And that and G here means is the gradient, uh, gradient. Now we use the norm of the gradient to identify the interface. And we use the direction of the uh, gradient to calculate the uh, overhaul angle theta here. And uh, uh, by using this, uh, this information we uh, we uh, define a new field kappa and uh, and the, uh, as you know as the the overhaul interface that requires uh, supports means the theta is smaller than a threshold theta zero uh, if by using this new defined kappa field and uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, it's, the the condition tend to Kappa equipment is bigger than the other point five. Uh, now we uh, using we use these uh, technology the technologies mentioned above. We propose the multiple filtering pro pro approach to identify the overhaul interface in enclosed voids. The design field smooth and we smooth and projected uh, to uh, give a mu and the mu is our uh, structural field. And uh, uh, firstly, we uh, implement the nonlinear virtual temperature method on the mu, and we uh, get the temperature field, and we project it, and we have the uh, t bar. Well, the t bar as this region with t bar equals one is uh, the enclosed void region. And uh, also, we uh, we use the, the gradient information of the um, of the, the field density mu bar, and we can calculate the um, the field kappa. And the within, uh, and also we projected uh, uh, the cover bar where the regions with cover bar equals one is the uh, uh, is is the in, uh, overhaul interface requires uh, requires support. Now we define a new uh, field gamma by using t bar and uh, cover bar here. Um, it equal it equal to um, uh, t bar t bar bar times cover bar, and uh, we can. 
uh, uh, we can easily understand that uh, the, the region with cap, uh, gamma on gamma on equals to one, um, uh, it, it's the uh, it's over hunter phase in the enclosed world. So now our uh, constraint is to uh, uh, to constraint the sum of the new field gamma to be the other. Uh, in order to use the uh, MMA to update the design, we uh, use a uh, um, we use a uh, relaxed uh, relaxed inequality uh, constraint. And uh, also in order to uh, improve the performance of the uh, of of this constraint when when it is close to uh, set to be satisfied. Uh, we use the knock function to enhance it. Uh, now, the most right one is our developed uh, constraint. By using this constraint, we developed uh, uh, the boost uh, optimization formulation um, for the structure with self-supported enclosed voids. Here, the, the boost formulation here is used to prevent sun and uh, hauling features such as like this. Um, now let's go to the part of example. Uh, the first example is an uh, MBB uh, design problem with different the boost parameter parameter. And uh, as you can see from uh, and the, the, from the results, the the red color here means the interface overhaul interface in our results uh, that requires support. And the blue uh, is the uh, our topology, and the gray is the enclosed world. And the open and the and the white is the open uh, open region. So from these results, we find that the uh, there there ex and only exists uh, some uh, red point in the uh, gray red gray enclosed region. So uh, and they are self-supported. Then this can verify our the effectiveness of our our method. And uh, as you can see, when as uh, a uh, parameter, uh, the boost parameter equals to the other, and the result has some um, thing and the high feature that has um, that have you know, uh, uh, manufacturer difficulty uh, in additive manufacturing. So, uh, but with the increase of the data data, these thing and uh, high features are presented. Um, Prevented. So this, uh, so our the 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 post formulation is very useful in this uh, in this um, problem. And we also consider uh, the the prop same problem with the uh, uh, linear method. And as you can see, the linear method failed to uh, to uh, uh, constrain the uh, overhead angle in this enclosed void close to the support. And this is because the uh, the the virtual temperature method failed to identify this enclosed void, and uh, as you can see, the temperature distribution uh, is very greatly, and uh, the temperature in this in the, in the in the this enclosed void is very low. And we also consider a uh, uh, cantilever beam uh, design problem with different allowed minimal overhang angles. And uh, uh, as can be seen, the, the, the structure is self-supported in the uh, gray region, enclosed region. And but uh, in, the, in, the, in the open regions, uh, we still need support in the additive manufacturing. Uh, so this can verify our the effectiveness of our method, and, uh, and the temperature uh, temperature uh, uh, as you can see uh, the is is uh, is uh, successfully controlled to the prescribed value, and uh, uh, it is very uniform in the in the regions covered by in the enclosed world region. We want to consider uh, uh, the problem with different build rotation. The first uh, example is uh, the build rotation is um, is uh, 45 degree, and the second is uh, minus half uh, minus half pi. And uh, as you can see, the temperate uh, topology, the optimal mass topology, and uh, especially the shape of the enclosed voids, uh, are totally different. Uh, so the build rotation has great influence on the uh, optimized topology and, and um, topology. And uh, 
yeah. And uh, as also you can see, the temperature in the enclosed void region is quite uniform. Uh, let me end this uh, presentation with uh, uh, several con conclusions. In this work, a novel method for optimizing structures with self-supported enclosed voids for additive manufacturing is proposed. And uh, this uh, proposed method is a good compromise between manufacturability and performance. And in this work, a nonlinear non virtual temperature method uh, is proposed to identify the enclosed voids and the multiple filtering uh, method uh, is proposed to identify the overhaul interface in enclosed void. And also the robust scheme is uh, applied in this work to prevent, prevent thin and high features. Uh, that's the work, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, yeah, with that, uh, also this talk is open for questions. Let me then start with the with the question. You 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 showed this this nonlinear uh, detection method, this nonlinear thermal problem that you used. This is much that makes it much easier to set uh, the critical temperature. Um, but it is a nonlinear problem. So can you comment on maybe the added cost? I guess it's a thermal problem, so it's not terribly expensive. But but still, uh, what is your experience on that? Yeah, um, actually, this uh, problem is not that uh, uh, it's not nice, it's not that expensive uh, because uh, every node ha has only one and degree of freedom. And uh, besides, uh, actually, in this work, we uh, uh, we we calculate we, we update the temperature every uh, ten steps. Then, uh, then the, actually, the time cost can be ignored. Actually, we tried it. Uh, the 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 uh, the uh, the time the time cost uh, is uh, much smaller than the than the uh, than that of um, uh, uh, elastic problem. Yeah. 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 Okay. So you don't have to update this each iteration. That that also helps a lot. Um, other questions, uh, maybe about this. Uh, presentation, but also any of the others. I guess we are now at the end of the session, so. Maybe, maybe Matthijs, maybe a quick question on this work. And, and I, I, I um, maybe I didn't understand, but, but the, so I was, I was sort of, uh, while you were presenting, I was thinking, Ooh, this is, this is very elegant. You're, you're using temperature to, to sort of identify shapes in a way, if you think about it in a general sense. But then I, 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 but then to detect overhang regions, you resort back to a geomet to explicit geometric representation. So what I'm driving at, and I'm, I don't think it's, but isn't there because I've seen work where people use max temperature to detect overhang regions as well. So isn't there something elegant in here where you can just use the temperature field and, and not calculate some sort of weird derivative of an overhang? Does that make sense at all, or, or, or not? Uh, sorry, uh, I just can't catch you. Okay, no, no, let's let's not. I I, I think it's uh, it's it work by Ranjan on 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 detecting overhang regions, looking at at temperature distributions. Perhaps you can look at that. Um, yeah, yeah. Sorry, can I just ask you know, or answer, Dirk? Uh, so really, the uh, reason why we have this is is to, uh, because we only impose the overhang in the uh, enclosed voids. So we need something to detect that one. Otherwise. Uh, we could just do without it. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. 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 Other questions to uh, Yun Feng or to any of the other presenters? I see there's also remarks in the in the chat. There's a question regarding does it work with holes in the design domain from uh, Johannes Neumann? Could you maybe clarify your question? Apparently not. <laughs> okay, then. Uh, thank Sorry, you for yes. the time. Oh yes, please go ahead. Uh, yes, thanks. Uh, basically, uh, whenever I try to use a heat equation for something like this, I always run into the problem that when you have a domain that has a hole in it, 
you would have to come up with something like a periodic boundary condition or something like this, right? Because you need to make sure that your heap can transfer to the hole. Let's say you have a hole in your domain and then you have uh, basically material all around it. And this would actually be something like a void. But now you also have in the 2D domain also a, an outside boundary, so to say, which would cool the, this, this void, so to say. Also, it should count as a... Uh, as, a, as an inclusion, so to say. So to clarify, do you mean a hole that there's actually no elements in the mesh in some region? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's not like voids, which which is the purpose to be detected, but it's actually yeah. the, the mesh topology is is. Yeah, I'm thinking obviously hole. for more complex uh, design spaces, uh, also in mm -hmm. 3D, then, right? Yes. Okay. Who wants to comment on that? I, I guess we need we need to model the void region to be able to detect it. Uh, so so it wouldn't fit. But but so you would need some kind of fictitious may, uh, uh, mesh technique to to make it work. Yeah. So oh, sorry, but couldn't you just impose a different? Sorry for interrupting, but couldn't you just impose a different boundary condition on the fixed inclusion? And then you would be able to detect it anyway, such that it wouldn't absorb all heat. Yeah, but it's this: if if the void is connected on both sides, you want it to transfer the temperature, as Johannes said, I think. So, mm -hmm. so somehow, you need to connect it. You have to make the the boundary infinitely uh, conducting, I guess, or something like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So, not using any gaps in the mesh yeah, that would be yeah. advised. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, considering the time, we are very much approaching the end of this session already. And I think it's time to give the word back to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Matthias, for organizing this session. And thanks to all our speakers, especially those in Asia who stayed late night. Uh, our next session will be on 27th May. Uh, it will be organized by Professor Newby and uh, Yan Jun from Dana University of Technology. And uh, this is actually the 12th session, which means we have been organizing this for almost one year. So. Thank you for your support and I'll see you next time. Have a nice day or have a nice evening. Yeah, see you next time. See you next time. Bye. 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 Bye.